welcome to the School of Love, the place where miracles are normal. Hello and welcome to the School of Love, the place where we learn practical tools based on scientific research and our own experiences towards improving ourselves, living life to its fullest and um, contributing to the best of our abilities to the world around us. I am Dr. Maria Grishdian and I am a professor of media studies and anthropology at Hiroshima University. In my free time, I am doing my best to guide you in building up a life of contentment, joy and fulfillment while applying lessons learned in school to overcome the difficulties, challenges and insecurities of the real world. In today's video, I talk about the novel 1Q48, or in Japanese, Ichikyu Hachion, by the Japanese writer Murakami Haruki. In international literary circles, Murakami Haruki's writings are often situated at the crossroads between enthusiastic readers with corresponding financial results and discontented critics who crushingly categorize them, so his writings, Murakami's writings, as consumption or trash literature. Comparable with Paolo Coelho's literary works, Murakami Haruki's writings, both novels and short stories, offer though unexpectedly keen insights into the aesthetic ideological mechanisms of syncretic cultural structures in late modernity, and thus a further common characteristics his writings share with Coelho's, Coelho's works. In this video, I analyze musical elements in Murakami's novels, with particular focus on 1Q84, or Ichikyu Hachion, as a means to construct a late modern form of artistic syncretism, while taking into account the stress ratio between the popular reception of Murakami's literature and the critical rejection it faces coming from the literary establishment in Japan, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the subtle tension between the contents and the formal tackling of that very contents. I start with a short introduction in Murakami Haruki's life and work, and then I delve more deeply into the literary details of intertwining musical elements with the, within the narrative architecture of 1Q84 or Ichikyu Hachion. And now, first things first, that is two important disclaimers. The first disclaimer serves to strongly emphasize the fact that this YouTube channel, The School of Love, is not part of my educational and research activities at Hiroshima University. It is nonetheless part of my privilege, joy and sense of duty to propagate, to propagate and implement knowledge, information as well as motivation and inspiration outside the limited framework of academic endeavors. Together, we can build up a better tomorrow for as many of us as possible. The second disclaimer relates to the fact that I am a trained musician and musicologist not a psychologist, therapist, or counselor. The ideas I am sharing in my videos reflect my deep going preoccupation with life, my own life and other people's lives, and express the results of my experiences, research, and for better or for worse, my failures and my recovery from those failures. Recovery, which is still ongoing. The ideas expressed in the videos on this channel, the, to, uh, the School of Love, cannot and may not and must not replace the consultation with specialists in whichever areas of your life you might have questions or you might struggle with. If you are new to the channel at this moment, I would like to ask you to please consider subscribing, sharing, liking, commenting. Thank you very, very much. This helps us not only with that mysterious algorithm which seems to dominate the YouTube galaxy, but also with contributing to the expansion of the community of humans doing their best to impact positively the world and those around them by discovering their authentic selves and living life wholeheartedly. Thanks again. And now back to today's topic, which is the novel, the massive novel, the monumental novel, 1Q84 by Murakami Haruki, or in Japanese, Ichikyu Hachion. And this video, I'll start with um, some biographical, da biographical data related to Murakami Haruki. Then I'll explain some major characteristics of the novel 1Q84, as well as um, its uh, characteristics. And I'll end up by 
um, rate iterating its uh, significance. So Murakami Haruki is a Japanese writer who was born in 1989, 9, 1949 in Kyoto in Western Japan. And he's famous for having published very n numerous novels and short stories, as well as essay, both belonging to fictionality and non-fictionality. He's also known for having translated many of many novels, many writings by uh, English speaking or English writing uh, authors. So um, in this video, in my videos, I talk so far about three, uh, two novels, the Norwegian Wood, Norway No Mori from 1987 and um, about um, the Wind of Bird Chronicle, or in Japanese, Nejimaki Dori, no uh, Nejimaki Dori Chronicle, which was published in 1994 and 1995. It's a bigger novel. And um, I highlighted, I, I did my best to combine literary critique with musicological analysis. In today's video, I do the same with 1Q84. Um, and I hope uh, you'll find some, by the end of this video, you'll find some answers related to the questions non-Western, uh, non-Japanese readers usually have related to Murakami Haruki, both in terms of his um, celebrity status and in terms of the, um, the the value and the contents of his novels. So, um, one Q eight eighty four is temporarily located between After Dark, in Japanese After Dark, published in two thousand four, and Colorless Tsukurum. Uh, Tazaki and his years of pilgrimage, or in Japanese, Shikisai Omotanai Tazaki to Tsukuru to Kare no Junrei no Toshi, published in 2013. Uh, 1Q84 is formally a Bildungsroman, a Bildungsroman or a novel of formation in English, combined with a love story and social critique. It takes over from Where Kafka on the Shore, published in 2002, in Japanese, Umibe no Kafka, left with its strong Oedipian undertones profoundly inter interwoven with the coming-of-age narrative of the main character. Moreover, 1Q84 addresses urgent issues in contemporary Japanese society, such as religious extremism and terrorism, as well as domestic violence, on the background of the initiation trips of two star-crossed lovers reiterating the ages-old motive of Romeo and Juliet, juxtaposed with Orpheus and Eurydice. The title, 1Q84, reminisces of George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, due to its homophonically identic pronunciation in Japanese, Ichikyu Hachiyon, and might allude to that sense of subliminal tension resulting from the uncertainty of possible parallel worlds embedded within our own reality, and the awareness of how one might contribute to its or their emergence and expansion. The three volumes of this monumental novel of Thomas Mann-like depth and length were published in 2009 on May 29th, the first two volumes, and 2010 in April 16th, the last one, with an instant success in bookstores. Unlike in former novels, the musical themes serve as leading motifs within the literary discourse, compensating for and enforcing the dramatic constitution while creating space for the three main voices in their slow, balanced, carefully calculated rise and unfolding in the eerie complexion of the narration. On the one hand, there is Leos Janacek's Sinfonietta from 1926, which plays the role of a beacon of light between worlds and offer glimpses into other realities, parallel or alternate, of possible encounters and evolutions. By its appearance at crucial points in the development of the action, Sinfonietta facilitates the transition between dimensions and reminds of the futility of resistance while simultaneously transcending humanity in an ongoing process. A second musical theme recurring throughout the novel and leading to a symbolical connection between the two main characters, Aumame and Tango, through the double moon dominating the sky, is Harold Erland's song, It's Only a Paper Moon, from 1933, with lyrics by E.Y. Harburg and Billy Rose. The intertwining of these two musical leitmotifs in the very fabric of the literary discourse 
contributes to the creation of a specific emotional tension, which eventually finds its resolution in the return to the one moon world, lacking the obsessive repetition of Janacek's victorious music. On the other hand, though, and beyond this surface consisting of famous musical entities compelling the readership to turn into a symbolical audience confronting classical and jazz compositions, 1Q84's symphonic monumentality results from a carefully constructed polyphony encompassing three voices complexly entangled in the narrative endeavor. The first voice belongs to Aomame Masami, the 30 year old woman officially working as a pro personal trainer, but also secretly involved with a private, possibly clandestine organization led by a dowager and for which she commits carefully selected murders. Sexually promiscuous and emotionally unavailable, apart from her yearning for her primary school best friend in school, Tengo, Aumame delivers in her clear observations of reality and cynical involvement with social events, an unfiltered vision of domestic violence as the unseen, undisclosed side of the Japanese society. Aumame is the ultimate sardonic observer of the world, and she, she does not scare back from evaluating the environment and those populating it with a brutal eye and judgment, lacking any emotionality. Her yearning for tango serves as the only ray of light in her otherwise dull existence, as, as illusionary and delusional as it may seem. Her femininity is that of a post-feminist woman who does not believe in love or in sentimental fulfillment, who does not need a man. But it is exactly a man or a boy from primary school and the memories of him which keep her on searching and believing. The second voice belongs to Kawana Tengo, an unpublished published author and a deeply jaded citizen who works as math tutor at the preparatory school or juku in Japanese and has a sexual affair with a married woman six years his senior who mysteriously disappears one day without any warning. Like Aomame, he was deeply negatively remarked by an unha unhappy childhood, in which the memory of Aomame, his classmate in primary school, who once tightly grasped his hand when no one was around, shines powerfully. Tango's lifestyle and worldview are typical for his demographic, lacking, it seems, motivation and ambition, and struggling to find a meaningful direction in his existence. The events force him, all of a sudden, to get in touch with a deeply repressed but incessantly burning desire to find that lost classmate, Aomame, as if her drive and longing for him have finally found a way to reach him, emotionally and mentally. Unlike Aomame, Tengo is passive and placid and waits for things to happen. He shies away from taking charge of his destiny. He is too the consummate post-feminist male representative with his lack of emotional involvement, his contentment in dead-dead romantic relationships, and generally the absence of any significant events or expectations in his life. On the surface and in theory, this might seem as a perfect existence for late modern individuals. But on a practical level, which resides in the depth of the human spirit, tangos floating around on the ocean of life is anything but fulfilling or at least satisfying and eventually leaves him burned out and unhappy. Searching for Aomai, a task driven by old memories profoundly buried under a heavy heap of painful newer experiences, full of guilt and shame at the same time, awakens him from his exile within his own time and sends him rushing towards feel, feeling alive and towards love. Their journey to find each other is a journey of self-discovery leading towards a soft unisono finale in which they manage to escape together the strange world with two moons and to come back into their original world with a single moon in the sky and the messy, complicated everyday stories. Small indicators that this might not be the real world persist though in an ambivalently magical open end. While coming to an own discursive line only in the third part, Ushikawa's narrative voice is the connecting thread between the two other main characters. A former lawyer fallen into disgrace, Ushikawa delivers a disenchanted and at times 
crude perspective over the human world and its fears, as well as limitations, and offers at the same time insights into the workings of the Japanese criminal system. In sad contrast to Aomames and Tengo's characters, full of life in spite of their lack of faith and optimism, Ushikawa's character is a symbol of the life's nonsensical jokes, a constant reminder of the abysses in the human soul and spirit, resulted from the absence of love, courage, and integrity. His narrative line is one of self-disgust metamorphosed into existential practice, and his death appears solely as the inevitable end of a sordid and senseless journey into nothingness. Thus, while 1Q84 is a novel of formation and self-discovery, through Ushikawa's grotesquely ugly and despicable character, it simultaneously turns the individual trauma into social trauma, outlining sexual abuse, religious terrorism, domestic violence, and normalizes them within the very texture of the narration. Eventually, Ushikawa is silently killed by Tamaru, the dowager's loyal bodyguard, an openly homosexual former service member of the toughest unit of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, or JITA in Japanese. He seemed to know too much about Aomame and Tengo, as well as about their connection, and vanishes without a trace, the almost inevitable death of a tragically anonymous character, pitiful in his lack of morals and individuality. Despite the rather dark setting and plot events, 1Q84 is an unusually positive novel. It's open and attains unexpectedly hopeful tones, with the two main characters, Aomame and Tengo, reunited after more than 20 years and watching the single moon in the sky from their hotel room. The formerly three-voice polyphony is silenced into a radical homophony, reminding of the warmth of togetherness and the reinvention of humanity as a gesture of love and forgiveness. There is, intricately embedded in the metaphorical lineup of the events, the sense of awareness and responsibility, which leads to a visionary identity and therefore makes place for the depiction of a mature individual, able to give and receive love in a mutual exchange of respect, trust and admiration. Our mames and Tango's return into the normal world with one moon is a return into the universe of warmth and safety, which is humanity after all, with its challenges, shortcomings and limitations. There are doubts, naturally, but they reside in the background of the adventure turning into normality and making place for the quotidian events to unfold. The final pages of 1Q84 restore the normality of life in its perennial continuity, and enforce once again its intrinsic value as a juxtaposition of kindness, friendship, and hope. The decisively romantic musicality of the explicit happy ending, unusually unusual for Murakami's novelistic postweights until that point, it carries similar features in colorless Tsukuru, Tazaki, and his years of pilgrimage, though in a more open-ended manner, unlocks the gate for a brighter world in which love and emotional fulfillment are real, and definitely worth striving for. That would be for me, from me for today. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for listening to me. And I'm looking forward to welcoming you uh, back here very soon again. Love and peace to you all.